Great, thank you, Abby. Uh, and welcome everyone to the UNC uh, CCCR, Core Center for Clinical Research uh, Speaker Series. We're uh, glad that you joined us. We're glad to see a nice crowd here uh, for this webinar today. Uh, so today's speaker uh, is not a stranger to us. He's been a long-term co collaborator with our group, um, and we're happy to have him with us today. Uh, it's Dr. Brian Pietro simone uh, an associate professor in the Department of Exercise and Sports Science and the director of the Motion Science Institute. Um, one thing that impresses me about Brian is he practices what he preaches because he can be found sprinting past me when I'm riding my bicycle uh, around campus. So his presentation today is titled The uh, Biomechanical Path to Osteoarthritis Following Knee Injury and a Gateway to Improved Outcomes. Uh, Dr. Pietro Simone, whenever you're ready to begin, please do so. Thanks, Todd. I actually just turn it up a little bit when I see you on your bike just to get by it, but I, I don't keep that up the whole time. Thank you, uh, you know, for having me. It's great to, to, to be able to speak to uh, this group um, and hopefully have some conversation at the end because so many of you have been uh, involved uh, in, in many of the projects that, you know, I'll talk about uh, today. Um, before I start, I, I guess I'll start with my first disclosure. I got a... Um, a text from Caroline Lisi, I think a couple of days ago, and she said, oh, wow, that gateway to improved outcomes, that's a lot more clever than you usually are. Um, and it's true because I totally stole uh, that from um, one of our undergraduates who, um, uh, Olivia uh, Salas, she actually got uh, her research um, highlighted in our, our Carolina Endeavors uh, magazine, and she used that, and I thought that was very clever, took it from her, but she also told me she she got it from Chad GPT, so that made me feel a little bit better. But um, other disclosures is uh, uh, Jason Franz, uh, one of my longtime collaborators over in BME, we put together a, a company uh, recently uh, called Veta Solutions, and uh, the relevance to this lecture is that we develop wearable sensors um, for, for gait retraining. So today I'd like to, um, that, you know, kind of describe some of the biomechanical changes that occur uh, following injury and how those mechanics, right, are linked to some of the harmful biological joint changes uh, that we see that may actually, you know, uh, lead to the development of osteoarthritis. And then talk about maybe some factors that contribute to this link between mechanics and biology. And then finally end up uh, hopefully talking about some of the future uh, clinical uh, interventions that some of this basic and uh, you know, translational science hopefully will, will lead to. Um, so I, I kind of cut out a lot of the slides for this group about how osteoarthritis um, is bad and just wanted to you know, spend more time with, with, with some of the biomechanical uh, data. So I'll just start by you know, saying that there are a lot of different risk factors that we all know, um, either to put a individual at a higher susceptibility for developing arthritis or, or a specific joint. Um, one of those major uh, you know, primary risk factors, right, is, is having a previous history of a knee injury. And you know, what I'll talk about today is some of the work that we've been doing in, in patients who are at high risk of developing uh, arthritis after a joint injury. So oftentimes we'll call the development of arthritis following joint injury post-traumatic arthritis. Um, it's been estimated that anywhere between 12 and 35% of all osteoarthritis cases uh, you know, follow a joint injury. Uh, I should say all knee osteoarthritis cases follow a joint injury. And this is important, right, when you think about uh, that knee injuries are most common in, er in early ages, right, younger individuals, when people are most active and most likely to actually sustain a joint injury. So this group of people who would develop up potentially post-traumatic osteoarthritis, they might develop at a much earlier age, right, than, than people we see typically de develop arthritis um, in, in older ages. And because people who develop tra post-traumatic osteoarthritis are often younger, they are seeking more uh, active lifestyles, right? People who develop post-traumatic arthritis may actually have more overall disability than people who develop um, 
of osteoarthritis later in life. So when we looked at uh, specifically, you know, evaluating people who are at risk of, of developing uh, post-traumatic osteoarthritis, we, we really kind of focused in on this group of individuals over the past decade, right, who have had an ACL injury. So that's an anterior cruciate ligament injury to the knee. And this is one of the most common traumatic joint injuries that we see in sport uh, and in physically active individuals. So a somewhat recent population study out of Minnesota showed that, you know, there's about uh, 68 or, or 70 uh, ACL injuries per 100,000 uh, person years. It's it's a little bit more common uh, to see this in males in the United States, um, and that's really because of American football. If we look at like sports, um, you know, like soccer or basketball, where both males and females uh, play those sports, it is it is more common in females. Um, the highest incidence, right, uh, depending on on sex, right, we see that females will actually uh, sustain these injuries slightly earlier in life, and males in their late teens and uh, early to mid 20s. And this is not trivial when we think about potentially uh, when people would be developing osteoarthritis after injury, females potentially developing um, that, that condition earlier. We see for the most part right now that, that younger people um, who have sustained a joint injury actually go on to, to have ACL reconstruction um, 75% of all people who sustain an ACL injury uh, choose reconstruction and rehabilitation. And if you're under 18, it seems like almost everyone, um, 98%. Now, the long-term consequence of ACL injury, regardless of reconstruction, um, is, is worrisome still, right? So this is uh, patient-reported uh, symptoms. Uh, this is from the International Knee Documentation Committee Index from the Moon Cohort, which is the the largest longitudinal um, cohort in the United States for looking at ACL. What we see is that, um, you know, even at two years, patients are only reporting to have 85% of their function. Uh, and that doesn't seem to change over the first decade, right? So essentially what people report at two years, they report at 10 years. A study that we did about a decade ago now uh, looked at uh, the uh, prevalence, right, of um, uh, radiographic uh, osteoarthritis in ACL reconstructed individuals and deficient individuals. And what we see is after that first decade, regardless of reconstruction status, we've about a third of individuals will develop uh, radiographic OA. And by the second decade, it's about half. So what we've been um, looking at, right, is what are some of the potential modifiable targets to um, that we can hone in on, right, to kind of stop this cascade of, of developing arthritis following a, a joint injury. And what we know, right, is that there are biomechanical changes that are associated with, you know, the development of osteoarthritis that occur following joint injury. There are biological changes that occur following joint injury. And we also know that these are, are somewhat related, right? The way that we move on the joint will affect the biology of the joint. The change in the biology of the joint will affect the movement on the joint. So our like long-term focus over the, the past decade, right, has really been to evaluate this, you know, cyclical relationship with the hope that if we could understand it better, potentially we could intervene maybe, you know, biomechanically or biologically to slow that uh, joint breakdown uh, and the joint pain associated with, with uh, knee osteoarthritis. The, there's a lot of biomechanical changes that occur following uh, ACL injury. We focused on walking primarily because they, the walking biomechanics change acutely following ACL injury. They're persistent for many years. We, we know that people walk differently after a joint injury for decades, um, you know, after having that injury. The small changes, right, because you, we, we take so many steps during the day, even small changes, right, in gait biomechanics can be magnified by the frequency with which we do this, this motion. Um, and it's modifiable. So if we could understand it better, you know, we could possibly modify it to prevent uh, osteoarthritis. So this is why we've focused in really on gait biomechanics, um, you know, over the past decade. So what I'd like to do is kind of take you through 
you know, some of the, the studies we've done to, to look at what changes um, are actually incurred after an injury. But first, I'd just tell you what our original hypothesis was, you know, almost a decade ago now, when I look back at, at, at when we, we started, you know, this process. We originally hypothesized that greater compressive loading uh, during gait in the ACL reconstructed limb would result in many of the early osteoarthritic joint tissue changes that we are worried about. Um, so, you know, when we look at, at evaluating that, that joint loading, we were really hypothesizing that, you know, as people would impact the ground, that initial impact would, would cause a more stiffened joint, so less knee flexion, and that we would have higher loading and higher loading magnitudes and rates that would, you know, break down the cartilage. And this original hypothesis wasn't, you know, pulled out of thin air. We had, you know, previous uh, studies that had looked at, you know, rabbit models where higher loads, you know, caused, uh, you know, deleterious changes to the cartilage, higher loading in people who have already had NEOA was associated with worse osteoarthritis severity. And there were some early studies in ACL reconstructed individuals that said, you know, later on, um, you know, maybe half a decade to a decade later, people had high, high loading. Um, so we, we felt pretty, um, you know, excited about this hypothesis, you know, we felt that it makes sense. Um, but I think if, you know, one of my favorite American philosophers always says it's, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future, uh, Yogi Berra there. So we, we said, we, we need to actually test this and, and kind of determine, right. If, if this is what the data is saying, or, you know, uh, if this, this hypothesis makes sense. So our thought was, what we wanted to do is look at gate, you know, characterize the gate biomechanics that change after ACL injury and determine how that affected those early cellular or metabolic changes uh, following injury and the, um, the abnormal tissue responses, structural changes, and eventually the disability that was associated with, with knee osteoarthritis. When we started this project, there were some limitations in the biomechanical literature that, you know, kind of required us to, to collect some more data to understand really the, the mechanics that were changing. There were three really good, uh, I think at the time, uh, meta-analyses and systematic reviews that kind of highlighted some of the weaknesses of the literature at the time. One, we didn't have a really good handle on the, the biomechanical changes that were occurring at early time points. So we didn't really know what was happening within that first year. A lot of the studies had looked at changes that were later than you know one year, so later than time points where, where we would actually be intervening. There were inconsistent comparisons. So um, we, we didn't have studies that looked at both the differences between limbs and compared to a control group. Oftentimes they would do one or the other and you know the the comparisons that were being made were were inconsistent, and the the majority of studies had looked at peak variables, right? So just one discrete variable within an entire you know loading cycle, um, and and making conclusions on on people's loading based on a, a single variable. So we needed to evaluate what was happening across the entire waveform. So. We started this, um, you know, uh, cohort. I would say almost ten years ago now, where we were evaluating uh, biomechanics, biology, uh, different tissue changes, and patient-reported outcomes uh, at different time points after surgery. First study that we um, we did really looked at ACL reconstructed individuals compared to age, sex, um, uh, matched and BMI matched controls. So our ACL individuals, we evaluated their 3D gait biomechanics and their involved and their uninvolved limb uh, at six months and 12 months compared to the, their match controls at a single time point. Uh, we did this with 3D motion capture uh, and overground uh, force plates. So I'm going to highlight uh, two major uh, biomechanical variables that we've kind of keyed in on over the past few years, and it'll show up in a variety of these uh, figures moving forward. So this first one here is vertical ground reaction force, and this is the the force in the vertical direction, right, that um, is coming back at the body that the body has to uh, essentially distribute, all right, um, as your foot is on the ground. So as we impact the ground, there's an increase in this compressive loading on the limb. 
all right, uh, that at mid stance typically decreases and then increases again prior to us taking our foot off the ground and, and pushing forward. What we saw in our ACL reconstructed individuals was not that they were uh, sustaining greater peak loads, right, at six months. They actually had lesser peak loads at six months compared to their under your controls. And this was similar at 12 months uh, in their ACL uh, uh, injured limb, that they had lesser peak loading, right, at um, uh, uh, at, at uh, 12 months compared to their uninjured control group. What's also interesting is although we initially characterized this potentially underloading because we were really focusing on those peak loads, we see that the ACL reconstructed group actually had higher loading during mid stance than their, their uninjured controls. So they essentially had lower peak loads but they were sustaining that same load uh, for a longer uh, portion of, of stance, right, than their uh, uninjured counterparts, right? So they had lower loading, but more sustained loading throughout stance. When we looked at their knee flexion angle, so this is how their knee is actually flexing, um, you know, uh, as they as they're, uh, have their foot on the ground, we see this initial increase in knee flexion. And then typically we go back into extension, right, before having... A, a dramatic knee flexion before taking our foot off the ground. Um, what we saw in our ACL in, injured individuals is that there was less peak knee flexion and there was less extension in mid stance. So they weren't getting their knee back into extension. They had more stiffer gait through most of uh, stance. Now, I think what was really interesting uh, from this initial study, uh, which has helped us, you know, uh, look at some of these biomechanical changes moving forward, right, was that when we looked at the ACL reconstructed limb compared to their contralateral limb at six months, right, we saw that that these changes or, or these limbs became more symmetrical in their loading over time, right? So their their uninjured limb right, actually was almost ex loading exactly like their involved limb, you know, at the 12 month period. So between six and 12 months, they became symmetrical. But what we know from that previous, um, you know, study against the uninjured controls, right, is that they are becoming symmetrical, but they're becoming symmetrically different from their uninjured counterparts, right? So this really kind of gives us pause to using this idea of limb symmetry to understand how patients may be recovering over time because they, they, they may actually be, um, be symmetrically poor uh, you know, over the, the, the 12 month period of recovery. So we got some um, recent data and this is from uh, Kristen Butner's uh, a study that'll be presented at ACSM uh, this summer, um, looking at some of these changes that are occurring within the injured limb and uninvolved limb uh, compared to their uh, uninjured counterparts, you know, through uh, pre-op. So this is at prior to ACL surgery, and then two, four, six, and 12 months. Um, and what we see is that there is this dramatic sustained loading in their ACL limb, um, which is, is similar there to their uh, uninjured limb, right, but becomes more symmetrical over time, but still more uh, sustained, right, even at the 12-month time period. We worked with um, uh, Jason Franz's group, um, uh, Mandy uh, Munch and, and Jason uh, Franz, uh, you know, helped us uh, look at the articular contact forces that were actually occurring in, in people who had limb level sustained versus dynamic loading. And what we see from this, and I'll, I'll give you a, a brief snippet here, because I know Jason is gonna uh, speak in this speaker series in a couple of months, and he'll probably talk more about this. But what we see is that uh, individuals who actually have more sustained limb loading have more sustained uh, joint reaction forces uh, that go along with this. So essentially what we're seeing here is in, in the medial uh, plateau that, that we have a very sustained loading pattern compared to this dynamic loading pattern that we would see in people who have more dynamic limb level loading. So what was happening at, at the limb, right, is actually being transferred directly to that tibial femoral joint. Further, when we look at our knee flexion, you know, throughout that first year, 
what we're seeing is that this this knee flexion angle is is stiffer um you know throughout the pre-op time period all the way through 12 months so while they are becoming similar in their knee flexion um, at 12 months they have less knee peak knee flexion and less knee extension still throughout that first year right so this might be suggesting um, that in addition to having more sustained loading, they may be having more localized sustained loading to their joint. So here's a, just a, a graphic that uh, Kristen put together for a recent uh, project at ORS, where if we look at um, a, a knee that's capable of flexing through an, a, a larger range of motion, they may have um, a sustained load or, or dynamic load that is actually applied to more of the joint surface. If we have a stiffer knee, right, that is actually starting more flexed and ending more flexed, almost like in this crouched gait pattern, they may have a more localized sustained load uh, to the cartilage, um, you know, potentially localized to the posterior portion of the joint. Um, so this would be an abnormal, you know, loading profile that is also localized to a very specific or, or you know, a less distributed portion of the tibiofemoral joint. Finally, uh, we, we, we looked at how ACL reconstructed individuals um, are, are, are associated or, or their gait is associated with people who have already developed OA. And this is a, a study that recently uh, came out in arthritis and rheumatology uh, last year uh, by Elizabeth Bjornsson. And what she did is looked at ACL reconstructed individuals who are six to 12 months post uh, ACL. And then uh, control individuals, so um, match controls to those ACLs, and then a group of individuals who had mild radiographic NEOA, so Kelgren Lawrence, uh, uh, grade two, and then severe um, a NEOA, so Kelgren Lawrence, uh, 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 four. And what we see is that our ACL or our controls are, have this dynamic loading pattern, and our ACL reconstructed individuals uh, here in red. Uh, have this more sustained loading pattern to the joint, lesser peak loads, but more sustained. And it's very similar, uh, almost exactly, um, to the to the people who are older uh, in their 60s who have already developed uh, mild knee osteoarthritis. Um, and, and then our people who have severe radiographic knee osteoarthritis have a more severe um, uh, uh, sustained loading pattern. So what this tells us, right, is that uh, six to 12 months post ACL uh, reconstruction, our loading profiles are more sustained and they resemble people who have already developed osteoarthritis. And this progression in sustained loading seems to mimic the progression in, um, uh, in radiographic OA severity. So in summary, um, our gait characteristics that we've we found is that there's after ACL, there's lesser peak loads. It's more sustained and people have stiffer knee uh, uh, range of motion throughout stance. And that's really uh, associated with lesser peaks and, le and lack of extension. We also have demonstrated that gait symmetry may not be the best way to look at uh, a recovery as people bilaterally develop sustained loading and stiffer knees uh, after ACL reconstruction for that first year. And our people, uh, our patients who are 12 to six to 12 months post ACL reconstruction have already developed gait biomechanics that resemble uh, patients with knee osteoarthritis. So let's link, let's look at how we've linked some of these changes to biologic uh, outcomes and patient reported outcomes. So our first study, um, we looked at some of these peak uh, characteristics and a group, uh, peak loading characteristics and a group of uh, people um, who uh, had ACL reconstruction, you can see here, they are um, you know, about three years post ACL reconstruction on average, and they have a variety of different graph types. And we focused in um, on that, on, on looking at that peak uh, vertical ground reaction force in this group. Um, and in this cross-sectional study, we evaluated type two uh, uh, collagen turnover. So what we actually saw in this study was that the individuals who have a higher um, a peak vertical ground reaction force had lesser turnover. So the individuals who had that lower peak, uh, more offloading initially of their, their joint had increased 
uh, type two collagen turnover. And we were a little worried that this didn't make sense with our initial hypothesis. So we conducted another study, um, tightened the group up and looked at individuals who are just about six months post ACL reconstruction. And we evaluated, sorry there, um, uh, interleukin-6, so uh, a pro-inflammatory cytokine, and then MMP3, um, uh, cartilage matrix uh, degeneration uh, biomarker uh, enzyme. What we saw, if, if we looked at just loading rate, peak loading rate, was that individuals who had lesser um, loading rates um, actually had higher MMP3. And we looked at medial compartment loading, so knee adduction angle, and we said, saw that people who had lower knee adduction angle, peak knee adduction angle, um, actually had a, a greater MMP3 and a greater IL-6. So this went against our initial hypothesis that greater loading would be associated with, with cartilage breakdown. Um, what we were seeing here was this, these initial um, lower peak loads were associated with you know, potentially more deleterious changes uh, in um, tissue metabolism. We also evaluated um, in a group of uh, individuals who are about three years post ACL reconstruction, um, a, a cartilage, a serum cartilage oligomeric matrix protein or COMP following 20 minutes of walking. And what we saw was very similar. People with, high, uh, with lower peak vertical ground reaction force had greater changes in uh, comp uh, after 20 minutes of walking. Similarly, at the time, we looked at um, uh, our cohort uh, who was um, uh, at six months. So their peak loads at six months and evaluated, evaluated their patient reported outcomes at 12 months. What we saw was that individuals who had lower peak loads at six months were um, were associated uh, with with greater or uh, sorry with worse um, uh, uh, CUSE scores. Uh, so patient reported outcomes at twelve months. So these data really kind of changed our thought of you know that maybe higher peak loads um, were actually worse in this group of people because all of the data uh, up until now was suggesting right that lower peak loads were associated um, with worse biochemical uh, changes and you know potentially uh, patient reported outcomes but one of the the problems that we faced at this point was that we really did not have a joint specific measurement so we utilized uh, a, a imaging technique uh, T1 row uh, relaxation times, which provide us an estimation of the proteoglycan content in the cartilage. And these changes can be seen within that first year post ACL reconstruction. Um, so you'll see higher um, uh, T1 row, so potentially hotter colors on this um, uh, color spectrum here, right, are associated with longer T1 row relaxation times, which are so associated with less proteoglycan content in the cartilage. And we know that proteoglycan is one of the, the first macromolecules to be depleted right in the cartilage as uh, osteoarthritis uh, uh, progresses. Here's a look at one of our soccer players just 12 months post ACL reconstruction. You can see um, compared to the, the same slice in their contralateral limb that their ACL reconstructed limb is actually showing higher T1 row relaxation times and um, potentially uh, lesser proteoglycan content. When we looked at our associations between our peak um, loading variables and T1 row, we saw the same thing. Higher uh, T1 row, less proteoglycan content was associated with lower peak loading, all right? Uh, and this was lower peak ground reaction force, loading rates, and even uh, knee adduction moments. One interesting finding that we, we kind of, um, made us also change this hypothesis or, or, or think differently about our hypothesis um, was that um, Elizabeth uh, Bjornsson looked at the correlation between um, all of the different points, right, in this uh, vertical ground reaction force waveform and T1 row relaxation times, uh, un trying to understand at what point in this, uh, in this loading cycle, right, were where it was loading um, really associated with changes in T1 row. And what we saw was that while there were associations, uh, moderate associations at the peaks, that really this higher mid stance, um, this idea that, that potentially the more sustained loading, not just the lower peak loading, but the more sustained loading 
was associated with worse T1 row, had the strongest associations with worse T1 row. So um, this kind of led to this um, uh, idea that really it's not the underloading that's the issue, right? It might be this, this, this lower but more sustained load, right, is the, the problem which is causing some of these changes. Now, the other issue that we were uh, having at this time, right, was that all of our data to this point was observation, right? There was associations between changes in loading, right, and um, uh, changes uh, in um, and, and biochemical and patient reported markers, but we weren't able to really say that there was a mechanistic link. So um, I worked um, with uh, Jason Franz on a way to essentially um, be able to evaluate the mechanistic link uh, in vivo. And we developed a, um, a biofeedback uh, paradigm where we would actually be able to uh, extract in real time that uh, vertical ground reaction force um, we would be able to essentially uh, use this force instrumented treadmill that you're, you're seeing right here to, to measure uh, a step by step vertical ground reaction force and then output that in a very simple, um, you know, uh, visual feedback uh, to, a, to a patient, right, and have them essentially change uh, that peak vertical ground reaction force, you know, as they were walking. So we first uh, developed this to look at a variety of different loading conditions. So we could look at their usual loading. We could make their loading symmetrical. We could increase both limbs and, you know, uh, and increase their peak loading. And we could lower their peak loading. Now, just, loader, uh, just uh, modifying that peak has dramatic effects on the rest of um, stance phase. So what we saw is that if we were to increase um their peak loading what that did was not only increase that peak but it made their waveform more dynamic so it made them look like con control uh loading so this was really a a great way to essentially evaluate you know how we could um change someone who had this habitual sustained loading to having this more dynamic loading pattern and it also um caused changes in their knee flexion angle Right, so they were. Um, if we increase their their loading here, right, they actually increased their knee flexion and came back down into uh, extension. Interestingly, if we taught people or, or cued people, I should say, to uh, decrease their peak loads um, here, what we actually caused was more sustained loading. So we made um, uh, individuals actually um, almost. This is not going here, but they 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 had more sustained loading and their knee flexion angles, you can see, are more flexed through all of stance. So they actually walked almost like they're walking on eggshells or crouching, um, which is exactly what we're seeing at, at pre-op and two and four months post ACL reconstruction. So this was a, a great um, you know, initial uh, uh, way to, to essentially uh, be able to modify um, uh, gait biomechanics acutely. We also, we, our, our first study, we looked at uh, serum changes in comp acutely uh, after these different conditions. And what we saw was that immediately following, um, you know, a walking protocol, we actually saw that uh, comp decreased more in this group where we had prescribed high or overloading, so more dynamic loading. Um, in a recent uh, study, that uh, Courtney Armitano Lago uh, just uh, published. Um, we and and we worked with um, uh, Laura Longobardi's group as well and and Tark. Um, what we saw right was that there was uh, yes this initial um, improvement or or decrease in uh, comp right in this high loading group compared to uh, low loading and habitual loading. And then if we looked at delayed comp. Um, increases. So this was three and a half hours uh, after uh, the loading had stopped, which we found uh, in a, a study by Caroline Lisi is actually more associated with some of these um, T1 row or proteoglycan changes in ACL reconstructed individuals. We saw that sustain, so symmetrical loading, um, which is essentially just higher loading on the affected limb, um, but not as high as the high loading condition. Uh, also showed, um, you know, lower comp um, at at this delayed um, time point. 
So overall, we see that these lesser peak and more sustained uh, uh, loads were observationally linked to um, different markers of, of knee osteoarthritis development, uh, serum and synovial fluid, uh, comp compositional MRI, patient reported outcomes. And we have some early mechanistic evidence that if we change loading, we can change some of these you know, acute uh, biochemical markers. So what factors may actually be contributing to this? And we've, we've been asked this question quite a bit, and I, I just added this in uh, you know, to be able to kind of address some of these uh, concerns. You know, one of the things that we, we do see that comes along with these biomechanical changes is that people walk slower and slower walking speeds have been associated with the development of, of idiopathic OA for, for years. Um, we can see that people from six to 12 months will actually slow down and be significantly slower than their match controls. And in a study by uh, Ashley Buck uh, recently, she actually put some uh, clinical thresholds right at at different time points post-injury that if people are less than 1.16 meters per second at, at two months um, uh, or 1.25 meters per second at four months um, and six months that we actually see much higher odds of them developing or, or demonstrating, I should say, symptomatic um, uh, symptoms, you know, symptoms, I should say, at six months post-ACL. We've, we've seen that slower walking speeds are associated with a T1 row, um, uh, type two collagen breakdown, and even more deformation after 30 minutes of walking. Um, but in another recent study, uh, that I thought I think is really interesting by uh, Ashley, um, what we do see is that if we acutely take an individual who um, is walking slower uh, post ACL and we increase their walking speeds to 1.13 meters per second, which is consistent with you know, what controls uh, a walk at, uh, the speed that they walk at, what we see is that it increases um, their dynamic uh, ground reaction force and their knee flexion a little bit, but it does not necessarily reverse it. So this suggests that just speeding someone up may not necessarily normalize their gait biomechanics. We also see that patients um, take lesser steps and have less moderate to vigorous physical activity after ACL. And Caroline uh, Lisi actually linked some of these changes in gait biomechanics, uh, lesser dynamic loading and uh, a lesser knee flexion or knee extension moment to people who are also taking less steps. Um, so this suggests that there may be an overall underloading profile, um, people taking less, um, less steps, less peak loading. But in a recent study um, you know, published by um, uh, Kristen Butner uh, last month, what we saw is that uh, individuals who are in this uh, high step group and this low step group may actually be different in some of their gait biomechanics very early on, uh, so at two months post ACL reconstruction. So essentially, they're changing their gait much earlier than we're measuring some of those changes in their uh, steps per day. So it's unclear, right? If the, you know which one, um, you know, if there's a chicken or an egg effect here between um, you know gait biomechanics and and loading, or and um, and steps per day. Finally, um, this is a question um, that I've. I've gotten quite a bit um, from a, a variety of people, I think, who are on this uh, presentation today. But you know, the, the question always is, well, are some of the early metabolic changes, right, that are happening initially after the injury associated with some of these biomechanical changes that are happening at later time points? And what, what we've seen is that it, it, they are associated. So in this study, we looked at synovial uh, fluid assessments of MMP3, um, at uh, the, the time of first um, uh, presentation in the clinic. So this was actually at a mean of six days post-injury. And we evaluated gait biomechanics. So this is even before ACL reconstruction. And we evaluated their biomechanics six months after ACL reconstruction. What we saw is that individuals within those first that first week after injury who had higher synovial fluid um, uh, MMP, MP, right, also were the people who um, demonstrated more sustained loading and more stiffer uh, knee flexion at six-month follow-ups. 
right? Suggesting that, you know, some of these changes um, down the road may be associated with, with some of these metabolic changes that are happening early. Finally, we've, we've often got the question, well, is it pain, right, um, in this group? And a lot of people uh, who treat ACL reconstructed individuals know that, you know, probably by six months, not many people are presenting with pain, um, you know, uh, while they're walking. But uh, in this study by Caroline uh, Lisi, what, what she found was she looked at kinesiophobia, so really fear of movement. And then she looked at this at uh, two months uh, post-ACL reconstruction with uh, CAM impulse, so uh, medial compartment uh, you know, loading of the ACL reconstructed joint. She looked at both measures of you know, pure pain and kinesiophobia. And what she found was that kinesiophobia was um, you know, associated with, with changes in, in loading but not necessarily need pain. So we may need to start to look at, how, at fear of movement rather than just you know, pain in the joint. So, so overall, a summary here of, of what's potentially contributing to these loading profiles. We have slower walkers, people are taking less uh, steps per day, um, and they have more sustained and stiffer loading. So there, there is a, a, a wider profile to this phenotype. And, um, you know, if, if we look at some of these early biological changes that are occurring to the joint and early fear of movement may also be contributing to some of these aberrant gait biomechanics that we see later on. All right, so, uh, I, you know, I guess in the next two minutes or three minutes here that I have, um, basically just talk about some of these, you know, ways that we can transition some of these findings um, to uh, clinical interventions. Now, what we've seen is that you know, uh, typically um, what happens after ACL reconstruction, right, is that, you know, most of our rehab um, focuses, right, on improving strength, improving neuromuscular control, really focusing on lower extremity mus muscles like, uh, you know, the quadricep. So most of our therapeutic exercise really is applied to strengthening with the idea that this would translate into better movement patterns. What we see is, you know, from the, the research that we presented today is that, you know, it may not necessarily directly translate, um, that potentially what we need to do is provide some sort of biofeedback directly, you know, at the level of the walking biomechanics to essentially address some of those changes in walking biomechanics um, to address the, the biochemical changes um, that are associated with the development of arthritis. So what we're doing now is using that same paradigm. We have a, a study um, we're actually uh, working with Virginia and uh, uh, Janik's group on this, uh, as well as you know Jason Franz um, uh, here at UNC to evaluate how gate biofeedback using that same paradigm uh, that we showed you before to to look at you know um, mechanism could improve, if applied over time, could improve some of these joint related um, changes. So here you'll see that we use the, the same um, force uh, treadmill, force uh, instrumented treadmill uh, setup. We essentially provide uh, 18 sessions of biofeedback, um, right? That is as, as ramped up over time. And then we actually uh, ramp down the amount of biofeedback and still keep the same number of steps so that we enhance some of the motor learning that these individuals are, are receiving. We are comparing this to a sham at this time. So essentially the active group, what we're trying to do is uh, increase their dynamic uh, nature of their loading um, by, by taking their peak loading and, and actually uh, bringing it to the same target that we see in uninjured controls and in individuals um, who are ACL reconstructed that do not, uh, uh, I guess, provide or, or show symptoms. So we use that as a target for our um, uh, experimental group. And our sham group has the same um, visual output, but what we're doing in this group is essentially providing them feedback on their normal step length. So we just zoom in uh, 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 pretty far in the resolution here so that it actually looks challenging. And, and all they're trying to do is, is keep their step length uh, normal. Uh, and they're blinded uh, to group. What we've seen in some of our early outcomes here, right, is that, you know, um, we're able to 
to get individuals, um, you know, by, you know, that 15th uh, session there, right, to essentially, um, uh, you know, be able to perform or, or retain, I should say, that, um, that peak uh, target that we're trying to um, uh, uh, modify. Uh, and we've seen that this actually um, in our, our first subject or our first pilot subject uh, related to a decrease in a T1 row relaxation time, which we're measuring um, in this group. Additionally, in a, in a project that was uh, uh, funded by the CCCR, um, we're also looking at if we actually can change strain in this group. Um, and in our, our first few pilot subjects, uh, what we saw is that in areas of the you know, uh, tibia where we had high cartilage strain from habitual sustained loading, when we taught them to do this dynamic loading, we were actually able to decrease that strain in those same um, uh, regions. Now, we also realized that um, it's going to be impossible to take this, you know, really, uh, you know, expensive force instrumented treadmill setup and, you know, scale it uh, to the, the clinic. So uh, at the same time, uh, uh, Jason, um, uh, Franz and I have been working over the past several years with a, a whole entire team. Um, and, and funded by the Eshelman Innovation Institute here to develop a sensor-based system that has the capacity to essentially evaluate um, or detect these uh, altered loading profiles and then be able to apply our same um, you know, uh, biofeedback using a smartphone tablet app. And in a uh, recent uh, preprint here that we uh, uh, provided by uh, Ricky Pimentel, um, what we see is that uh, our, our system operates uh, without uh, the expensive, sophisticated hardware or software um, that we have to, to use now. It's capable of measuring those uh, same force outputs, and we can detect aggregate um, mechanics, right, that um, are, are associated right with those uh, those changes in biology and and actually treat them. Uh, so um, hopefully have more on this um, these, these projects uh, in the future. So in summary here, increasing loading with real-time uh, biofeedback may result in, in more normalized biomechanics. There's early research that suggests that modifying this load may actually Im impact that tissue biology and then wearable text is on is on the horizon to scale this intervention uh, in the future. Uh, so thank you to uh, a lot of the funding mechanisms that have helped um, uh, with the research that I've uh, discussed today. Uh, and and thanks to uh, uh, my little team who's done a lot of this work um, that I, I got to present. Thank you. Great. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Brian. Um, we do have uh, almost 10 minutes. Uh, left in this hour or any questions that you might have. Uh, I welcome you to unmute yourselves to ask your questions, or if you wanted to put anything in the chat, we can try to read those uh, and respond to those. Any questions? Brian, this is Virginia. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. And what I especially loved was um, your clear presentation. And I heard a couple of new Paper. So I was looking those up on the side. So, and especially your new 2023, it looks really, really good. So thank you for that. Um, I've got a question that I'm, I don't know any of us know the answer to, but I wonder what your thoughts are. You know, consistently people are showing that it's the delayed release of comp that seems to be more informative in terms of joint health. I wondered if you had any thoughts about why that is as opposed to the acute change. Yeah. I mean, I, I think maybe you would have a, a little bit uh, better idea of potentially why I, I know that it's been hypothesized, right? That, you know, potentially this delayed change is more associated with, you know, the, the metabolic, you know, uh, changes that, you know, the loading um, may be, you know, uh, I guess uh, affecting at the joint, whereas, you know, the acute, um, change in COP may essentially be what's effluxed from the joint, you know, into the, the bloodstream, you know, immediately, you know, after a loading. Um, 
we have, and I, I, I showed that paper by Caroline, where we actually were able to, uh, in that same group, you know, look at associations with, um, you know, the delayed comp versus the immediate comp and our association with a T1 row. And we did see that the, the delayed comp was associated with some of those resting proteoglycan changes rather than the, the acute. So it kind of maybe provides, I guess, some evidence to suggest the, the hypothesis that the delayed comp, um, you know, assessment is associated with, you know, some of the resting metabolic changes that are occurring at the joint. Um, I will say it is a real pain um, to measure that. Um, which is, you know, I think kind of the, the, the difficult, the difficulty in that measurement is that, you know, essentially you have to control their loading for three and a half hours after they get off the tread. And it's, it's, a, you know, a bit of choreography, right. To get them off the treadmill, get them into, uh, you know, a, 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 a chair and then a supine position, you know, ensure like if they have to go to the bathroom, like we're wheeling them to the toilet, you know what I mean? So it is uh, a real pain to get that measurement, but it does seem to be associated with, you know, those imaging markers of, uh, of change. I don't know if I answered your question. I oh, just, it, yeah, that's I, great. That, that, and yes, to remind everybody about how difficult it really is. So I, I really congratulate you on that great study. Thanks. Uh, Richard, you had a question? Um, yeah. Thanks, Brian. It's great to see how your work has evolved over the last 10 years since uh, since I, at least I've been here. So it's it's really come all the way to you know intervention, which is fantastic. Um, one really simple question and then one that's going to be hard to answer. The simple one, with the reduced peak load but more sustained um, load in the middle of the gait cycle, as you showed, does that result in a, like if you had to calculate the total load on the joint for a gait cycle, so do you have more total load or is it just less dynamic? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, even your simple questions, Richard, I always find this difficult, but um, the, the, uh, the, the question that you're asking, right, is, you know, if you have uh, more sustained load, do you have essentially have the same impulse loading, you know, across the, the joint? And, you know, that's what we're seeing is that, you know, potentially even when we change it to a uh, dynamic, you know, we increase that peak. And I think that's where people have been a little worried, you know, and, and we struggled oftentimes, I think with this just initial, how we're describing it. Um, are you, are you increasing the total amount of load to the joint? And essentially the, the impulse is staying very similar, right? So the total loading to the joint is similar, but the way or the manner that it's being loaded is more dynamic versus, you know, more sustained. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, that's a really great question and something that, you know, is simple, you know, biomechanically, but I think we needed to do a better job of actually explaining that because I think the people oftentimes get worried about that initial discussion of high peak load. Mm -hmm. Right. And then my other questions related to, to pain, um, you know, it's very difficult for us to report all the pain. You know, we, we probably have these nociceptors in our joint that are recognizing pain that we can't really feel when we a answer a, a pain questionnaire, for example. So I'm wondering if some of the changes in loading that you see after ACL injury are more uh, subtle changes within the joint that are related to, to pain sensation that you might not, you know, capture when you ask people about the pain. And maybe that's related to the kinesiophobia that you that you found was more more um, important than just pain. Yeah, I think, I mean, there have been a, 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 a lot of studies that have looked at, you know, I guess pain, you know, post ACL, but also even the, the proprioception, right? So potentially even, you know, the ability to, to sense, you know, uh, changes around the joint that are you know, impaired, right? So I think, you know, your question is, is really interesting, you know, are we, and I think that this is even a, a large, larger conversation that I, I think we were having this week with uh, Louise and, and Joe of uh, Hart about, you know, just how we're actually measuring a pain and dysfunction in this group. And do we have the best 
best patient reported measures to to actually do that. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. I, I I don't know if we're we're getting the the best measurements just by asking people how much pain do you have, you know, while you're walking. Um, but I think it is really interesting and something that we haven't looked at a ton. And I think you know, uh, Shelby, Dr. Shelby Baez, who I think is doing a a talk for you in a couple of in a couple of uh, weeks is to talk about uh, kinesiophobia. I think that might be, um, you know, a, maybe a more relevant uh, marker early on too, um, or, or just as relevant as in pain. All right, thanks. Uh, there was one question in the chat from Jason Kim uh, asking, what does GATE look like for ACLR patients with obesity? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so it, I think that, you know, one of the things that we have been interested in, um, you know, in some of the, the new projects that we've gotten involved in with, with Lee and uh, Steve Messier is the, you know, the idea of uh, obesity as well, as, you know, as a primary factor. And, um, you know, I think uh, there is a bit of an interaction, right, between obesity, um, you know, related gait changes and uh, ACL related uh, gait changes. And I'll, I'll, I will say to Jason, um, maybe uh, we'll give us a, a couple more months. Um, we actually have a postdoc who's in, in Ashley uh, Buck, who's a doc student here, who are, are both really interested in this. And they've been um, looking through our data to actually evaluate some of the interaction between um, you know, BMI right now, uh, uh, changes and some of the, the gate related changes. And I, I will say that there, there seems to be an early, um, interaction, right. Or modifier where, you know, potentially higher, higher loading, um, you know, and, and people who have high BMI might, might look a little bit different in how it interacts with some of those biological measurements. But, um, but we, we have seen some early indicators that this more sustained loading may be, a bigger issue in people who have higher BMI than it is if you have low BMI and ACL. Um, so I think there's a lot of, of interesting work, um, you know, in this area that, that is kind of on the horizon. Great. Thank you. So we've run out of time for me to ask my questions about the uh, Yogi Berra uh, philosophy, but uh, thank you, Brian, for <laughs> taking the time to, to share with us today. Uh, Everyone, thank you for joining us. Before you leave, please do um, complete a very brief poll that will pop up. Uh, thanks for attending, and I wish you all a wonderful Leap Day tomorrow. Thank you.